Massachusetts. Welcome everybody to this webinar um, that is being jointly held by our organizations and um, by our uh, legislators, um, Senator Moran and Rep Dome. And they're here tonight to tell you a little bit more about the bill, uh, the bills, plural. Um, and I think what I might do is just uh, turn it right over to Chris Hope and let him do some introductions of our legislators, and then we'll we'll take it from there. Great. <laughs> I'm not at home, so I'm, and I'm on a on, on a iPad, so I'm doing my best. Um, no problem. So um, I'm Chris Ho. I use a wheelchair, and I've been a PT1 rider for the past six years. I quickly discovered that this was neither safe nor reliable and that we really didn't have any protections. Um, luckily, I was able um, to connect with advocates from Greater Boston Legal Services, Disability Law Center, and Boston Center for Independent Living, who had already begun organizing to make improvements. Um, and we were able to convince administration to make some improvements in the program. However, they were stalled until the beginning of the HST task force, which started in the uh, beginning of 2022. And uh, that's where I met Representative Mindy Dom from the 3rd Hampshire District and Senator Susan Moran from Plymouth and Barnstable District. And they're truly two exceptional legislators. They were such quick studies, learned about the deficiencies at HST and really became, along with those of advocates, really amplified our calls. And at the end of the task force, they, along with a few of us, voted not to make a, a, approve a final report because they understood that there was more work to do. And that's where uh, the idea of extending the task force, which is one of the pieces of legislation, and also creating a permanent um, consumer advice, advisory board um, worst uh, came up. And um, we're really so lucky to have them taking the lead. And I'm going to, I know people are on tight time. So I'm going to hand this off to, I believe, Senator Moran. Wonderful. Thank you, Chris. You're welcome. Thanks, everyone, for being here. Okay, are we waiting for Senator Moran? Um, oh, Cameron, right, we're waiting for Cameron. Oh, and here she comes, perfect timing. <laughs> hey, Cameron, have you joined us? I'll scroll down, see if I can find Cameron. Well, no one could believe that I'd be that brief. So I guess that's I, it. Yeah, everyone I, thought <laughs> that's great. <laughs> all right. What? Hello, all. Sorry for the connectivity issues. Hello, Rep. Dom Hi. And all. How are you? We're so glad you're here. Senator Moran. You're not Cameron Lease. <laughs> uh, he, he's my he's my backup, my backbone. <laughs> Welcome, Senator. We just started. Chris just gave us a wonderful, extremely complimentary and generous introduction, and you're on. Well, thank you for that. And I'm so excited for this forum because, you know, Rep Dom and I have been, you know, really so simpatico. And it's so rare in a legislative partner to have someone who, you know, really is the other half of your brain and your work ethic and your sense of appreciation. And I just um, uh, really want to convey how much we focus on translating that 
to this um, issue, this, you know, sort of contingency of experts that, you know, the folks that are right here. And um, I, I, you know, I've got to fit in the fact that I, I, um, I've got two things. Um, one is I'm supposed to be at a town meeting. Second one is I'm doing it um, online because um, a family member from the weekend just tested positive. So I'm, you know, there's a, some complications. And so Repdom has really, talk about generous, has generously um, offered to kind of carry the lion's share. But I, you know, and, and Chris, thanks for all you're done, all, all you have done and others. But the, you know, the guts of this is the coordination. We just today did a forum on health services and uh, regional transportation and really the equity issue about kind of um, uh, Boston with the equity of rural communities like Repdom and I have. And we're sort of dovetailing this in with the equity of all community members, right? And so it, it's really a, a matter of having a, a straightforward voice that will resonate and being able to paint a picture that will really kind of be, uh, you know, tattooed on people's brains when they think about the whole issue of transportation and community and communicate that in um, hearings and to legislators and to the administration. So that's, um, you know, that that's what I'm thinking about as, as we, you know, as we sit here and I'm, I'm really also thinking about the power the strength in the organization of the folks I'm looking at here. I'm in terms of really lifting up the needs and actually, you know, fighting for equity in that regard. And I, I just can't think of anyone else to um uh to do it better than Rep Dom. So I'm gonna sort of throw it back and um, just listen for a couple of minutes. And really, the other thing I want to say is my staff are here with you. Uh, it's a powerful group. And we all, you know, we all work together, you know, at, as sort of the hands of a clock. So as, as this moves forward, we will continue to, you know, sort of give feedback and, and support and, you know, just, um, really look for your creative ideas and hopefully try to advise you on the biggest impact that they're going to have. So Repdom, so um, kind of you to um, be my my bookend on this as, as we, you know, we power forward and I apologize for the technical difficulties, but I'm going to be on for a few more minutes before I've got to jump to the other. Um, thank you. Thank you, Senator Moran, so much. Um, and thank you for your kind words. Um, and I couldn't imagine doing this with anybody else. Um, this is a real partnership between the House and the Senate. I'm so thrilled and with the community, with Chris and with everybody on this call. And um, those are exactly the kind of partnerships that are so successful in the State House. So I'm looking forward to these bills crossing the finish line. Um, I'm gonna start, thank, I hear you, see you cheering. Um, I'm going to just start by saying I was on the HST task force almost like by accident. Um, I was asked to sit on it by um, leader Sarah Peak, who uh, is a rep from Provincetown in the Cape. And I jumped at the chance because I didn't know that much about HST transportation, but I knew there was a consolidation. Um, I knew that consumers were concerned about it and a lot of my constituents were concerned about it. And so I thought it'd be a great opportunity to learn, which it was, um, because the task force had great teachers like Chris who were willing to explain and give background on information. And the people who represent the administration were also um, willing to explain and discuss 
a lot of these issues. Um, so I think what you're going to hear in this PowerPoint slide that I'm going to um, presentation that I'm going to present is there's a couple of themes. One theme is your voice and your experience is really what this is all about, and it's our secret weapon. And it's our secret weapon in creating and passing good legislation. The task force was all about making sure that consumers' voices were being heard and addressed. And as you heard from Senator Moran and also from Chris, we weren't um, we didn't think that the task force's work was over when they um, submitted a final report. We were feeling like we were just getting started um, and that the recommendations that came out at that time was a starting point, but not an end point. One of the things that we noticed um, is that while the task force was in place, it acted like a monitor of a sort. And things got done because there was a set of eyes looking for it, not just our eyes, the people who were on the task force, but consumers. Many of you participated in listening sessions that happened across the Commonwealth virtually. Um, and so people were engaged and that engagement sort of created an accountability that allowed for things to get done. And Senator Moran and I both felt that that accountability needed to continue in order for services to continue to improve. Lily, can you go to the next slide, please? So thank you. So um, in conversation with Chris, other members of the task force and each other, Senator Moran and I decided to file two bills. One bill would extend the task force so that the work of the task force could continue. And the other bill would create a consumer advisory board for the non-emergency human service um, human service transportation. And this, we felt this combination of bills that would extend the task force and also create a consumer advisory board would help to sort of operationalize and institutionalize the consumer voice and experience um, in delivering this service. And so if you think of delivery of a service as a continuum, continual kind of um, program, the voices of consumers, many of whom are on this call tonight, would allow um, that service to continue to be improved. Um, there would continue to be gaps identified, and there would also continue to be, most importantly, remedies suggested, because the remedies that came from the community of consumers were the remedies that helped to make this service safer and more reliable. So um, the first bill, I'm going to actually do the right column first, is extending the human the task force. And bills in the legislature have two different numbers. If there's a House member that filed it, they get a House number. That starts with an H. If a senator has introduced a bill, that number starts with an S. So I am the House filer. And um, I'm joined with um, Representative Peek as a co-filer. And Senator Moran is the filer in the Senate. And so you can see that the continuation of the task force has two different numbers, S-121 slash H-3302. The bills are identical. They're just in both bodies. And that's really to just help to facilitate um, the passage of the bill later on and to get it onto the floor for a vote. Um, both of those bills have been filed, have been sent by the clerks to the Committee on Transportation, which is terrific because it's good to have a transportation service in the Transportation Committee. And it's also really good to make sure that they're in the same committee. And I'll talk a little bit about that on the other bill. I'm sorry, I see there's a little bit of a glare and it's making me, it's distracting me. So I'm going to pick up my computer. Um, the other bill, which is in the left column, is the bill that establishes an HST consumer advisory board. And again, we have an H number and an S number because it's been filed in both the House and the Senate, the identical bill. And you can see these bills. We can either send you copies or you can go onto the Mass Legislature website at www.malegislature.gov and we'll make sure you have that link. Um, and you can look up the bills, download them and read them. Um, unfortunately, the House clerk and the Senate clerk sent these to two different committees, but maybe it's not so unfortunate, and I'll tell you why in a moment. 
the House bill was sent to the Joint Committee on Transportation, and the Senate bill was sent to the Joint Committee on Public Health. Please remember, these are identical bills, and every bill that gets filed in the legislature will get a public hearing in the committee that they're on. And so one benefit, I'd like to see a silver lining, in having this bill go to two different committees, that public health and the transportation, is that double the number of legislators will get an opportunity to weigh in on it, and that will help to build support. Lily, can you move the slide, please? Thank you. So again, this is the theme, sharing your experience with barriers, problems, um, safety concerns, et cetera, with the current service is going to help legislators understand why these bills are necessary and how they will help make it better. And this is the essence of legislation, right? We're, we're introducing legislation to make something better. And we're also introducing legislation in this case to make government more accountable to the consumers of the service that it's delivering to. So telling your legislators, your reps, your senators about why you think these bills will make it better is going to be important because they may not know. And we shouldn't assume that they know unless we've told them what the problems are. Next slide, please. So you have to think about, and in terms of advocating for, let's say the extending the task force, or creating the Consumer Advisory Board, how will those two bills improve safety and or reliability? From my perspective, and I'm not gonna, this is really a, um, a question that you need to answer for yourself, but the reason why we created them in response to those concerns was we really felt that it helped to increase not only accountability on the part of the service provider, but it also provides your voice and your experience to drive, if you'll excuse the pun, um, the quality improvements in the service. And since this is a consumer service, we wanna make sure consumers are safe. And so we need to have your voice at the table consistently. So for example, we heard a lot of different things about the experience with the service. There was improper equipment and training of drivers to safely secure wheelchair users. Chris was incredibly helpful and I think um, effective in making sure that simple measures that could be implemented quickly could help increase um, both the training of, provide, of, bus, of drivers, but also the safety of consumers. There was significant delays in pickup or cancellation resulting in missed appointments, missed appointments that then you'd have to wait weeks or months to be able to reschedule. Sometimes inappropriate treatment of passengers and people with mental health or intellectual disabilities. Difficulty scheduling. You know, we kept hearing, oh, scheduling can happen on phone, online, app. There's all these ways to do it. But consumers continue to have difficulty with it. So we needed to address that. It's great to pat ourselves on the back when we do something great in government. But if we're just patting ourselves on the back and we're not really listening to people, we're not making improvements. There was a failure to inform people of their rights. There was poor follow-up on complaints. And this here, in this case particularly, that how important that is to have continued monitoring and accountability is what's happening with complaints. How are we responding to them? Um, and there was inadequate oversight and enforcement of contracts. Some of these continue. I don't want to um, lead you to believe that they've been all corrected. And the reason why we um, filed the bill on extending the task force is that the ones, some of these bad experiences with the uh, service need continued vigilance and continued activity in order to be fixed. Next slide, please. So when you're advocating for legislation, and I hope someone's keeping time on me because I could just talk, talk, talk. Um, but um, when you're advocating for bills, there's a couple of things that you can ask. And the reason why this is important is there's two things you need to always do when you advocate for bills with legislators. You need to have your voice and tell them why you think the bill is important, what problem does it fix, or how is it going to make life better. But the other thing you need to do is you have to have an ask. And I know there's going to be some tips later on. Um, so these are my our tips. Um, I'm sure the ARC will and Chris will provide additional ones. But the ask is super important. What do you expect the legislature to do? We want to be told by our constituents what they want. We don't necessarily want to be treated like puppy dogs, 
but we do want to be told what they want in addition to what they need. Um, so the first thing you can do, even before there's a public hearing, is you can ask your legislator co to co-sponsor the bill. We all know how to do it. We go onto a special website and we basically click a button that says co-sponsor and boom, we're on as a co-sponsor. And so you can ask legislators to do this by email. You can ask them to do it in person when you see them. You want to give them the bill numbers and you want to ask them to co-sponsor. And if you can, you want to write maybe about or speak like a couple of sentences about why you think it's important and why their support is important to you. That's a good practice for ultimately doing something in a public hearing. But the first thing is asking them to co-sponsor the bill. Next slide. Then comes public hearings. There are two different committees that will be hearing these bills with two sets of chairs. Every committee has a House chair and a Senate chair and members. So there's public health and there's transportation. And we're gonna be speaking in front of transportation on both bills and public health on one of them. You can participate this year in public hearings in one of three ways, in person, in writing, or virtually. This is really critical. For I represent a district in Western Massachusetts. Um, for people in Western Massachusetts, having a virtual hearing is huge, as well as for many people with disabilities, because it will mean you won't have to drive into the state house, you won't have to navigate the state ha state house, you won't have to figure out parking, and you don't have to take a day off from work. You can actually just use your three minutes from a computer wherever you are, from your home or from your office. Um, and so there will be virtual um, ability. And what will happen is when the hearing gets announced, it will um, include specific directions on how to register to participate, which will include how to participate virtually. You don't have to do it in person if you don't want to, and you don't even have to do it virtually. You could just send it in writing if you can. Um, and you could you know, dictate it to somebody if writing is difficult. Um, I don't know if they actually accept videos, but we can find out if they do. Um, but if you do speak in person or virtually, you'll be limited to about a three minute time limit. So our advice is prepare for two minutes. And if you've got more to say, put it in writing. Next slide. So we call this testimony when you go to a committee and um, tell them that you support a bill and that you want them to advance the bill. But here's just some tips on what you should include in your testimony, your name and your town. Thank the chair people for the opportunity to testify and for hearing you out. Name the bill, give them the number and the little description of the bill that you're testifying in support of and the description. Describe your experience with HST. Describe how this bill will make the service better. Again, it's about how is this bill or these bills gonna fix the service and make it better, safer, and more reliable. And then your ask in testimony isn't necessarily for people to co-sponsor the bill. You want the committee to help push the bill to the next stop in the legislative process. And so you want them to advance the bill from committee. That's your ask. And then make sure you thank them again. Next slide. And there's our email addresses in case you need to reach out to myself or Senator Moran. Um, we will, our offices will certainly let people know when this hearing is happening. You can also follow it on that website. If you go to the webpage of the specific bills, um, they'll have a little tab there that says bill history and also hearings. And you can check that every now and then and see if it's been posted. But I'm sure the ARC and the Centers for Independent Living and the Disability Rights Project are all going to let folks know when this hearing is. So I think I'll stop there if I can. And I want to thank you for organizing this and bringing everybody together. I want to thank everybody for being so involved. Again, your voice is what matters here. Your experience is what's driving, quite frankly, these bills. And you also want your experience to be what the legislature kind of responds to. So I'm really looking forward to the rest of tonight's um, presentation and to hearing from all of you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rep. Dome. That was 
That was perfect. Um, and and thanks to the senator as well. Uh, I just thought maybe this would be a good time just to make sure people didn't have any questions on your um, slides or if, if people had any burning questions before we jump into the next um, line item. Sounds good. I'll let you sort of navigate the questions if there's any for me. Sure. Okay. Let's see. People can unmute and ask, but I see um, that we have just basically links to the bills here. And thank you for for, for uh, posting that link. That is super helpful. You can go on, you can look at the whole language of the bill. You can see what committee it's in. Um, and you can actually see how many co-sponsors when you look uh, look to those links as well. And then that's what Repdome was speaking about. We're trying, still in the process right now, trying to get more co-sponsors. So that's a, a perfect ask. Um, does anyone else have questions? All right, I thought I think we'll just continue on kind of uh, a little bit of focus on legislative advocacy, and it works out really well, Repdome, because I I um, kind of focused on a few other things than what you focused on, so I think it might be good co combining them, um, and then uh, and then we'll open it up for people to ask questions, tell their stories, and really try to uh, leave here feeling very comfortable about your next steps. And um, when these hearings pop up, nobody's going to feel unprepared. And I think that's the, the best we can do. We actually had a hearing today um, in front of Ways and Means, and it really worked beautifully in terms of the hybrid. Um, it just went back and forth between folks testifying online and people in person. The people in person were a little impatient, um, but the people online um, we were able to fit in so many, so that was great. But anyway, let me share my screen. I have too many things up. Um, and just take you through a little bit. Some of it's a little bit repetitive here, but we'll jump right in and kind of we're right on track with the agenda. And Repdome already went over both of these bills, so this is great. And I think you all know that we have a fact sheet, which is really nice. It's a very clear fact sheet that you can use for each of these bills. It can help you when you're writing your testimony. It can help you when you're talking to your legislators. So make sure you have a copy of that that we can, we can definitely send out um, to all registrants. And um, I just thought I would stop, start with, you know, what, how, how can we be the most effective advocates? And um, this is just a photo from um, last fall. I think a couple of you here are, are in this photo um, where we successfully passed the special commission on the history of, of state institutions. And um, I put it here for a little bit of hope and inspiration because I think uh, it, it, it took a, a huge coalition of work, but we were able to get it through in one session. So it's my one session bill I like to talk about. <laughs> but, um, you know, and just backing up for a minute on really what is legislative advocacy, you know, and this is definitely a review for all of you that, that have been doing this for a long time, but it is just clearly communicating an issue or a cause to persuade, to engage and educate and persuade lawmakers. Um, it takes, it can be year round. We can be talking to our legislators year round about the issues that are important to us. It can be one-to-one, -one, you know, you meeting with your legislator, telling your story, uh, bringing family members, um, or it can be mobilizing thousands, which you've seen from some of our organizations when we send out an action alert. During the pandemic, we would send out an action alert for, um, ex for example, around hazard pay when our workers weren't getting hazard pay even they, when they were on the front lines. And when I talk about thousands, I think we had 25,000 uh, letters sent to the governor around getting hazard pay for our frontline workers. So it's, it can be either of those and anything in between. Um, and you know the goal for us is that you're always building champions, champions in the legislature that begin to understand our issues. And you know they can be specific issues or they can be broad issues. 
Um, but I, I like this slide because I think you could all add, you know, another dozen things to this, but um, it's not as simple as just communicating, right? You're, you're in trying to persuade or educate. It's dogged determination. It's using crisis. It's, 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 it's um, using the lived experience. I think that is the, the key here. Um, data is important. We have to have our facts, right? Um, legislative leverage. I, I, I say that one because I know uh, when we don't have champions that are standing up and going to leadership and, you know, kind of putting it on the line, um, the, the bills have, you know, a harder time getting through. So that legislative piece is, is key. Coalitions like this one um, and growing it and continuing to grow it. And you all know and can add a whole lot more, but right now social media and media is important. You know, tag your legislator when there's a hearing, when, when you've had a meeting, um, let them know the work you're doing and bring in, you know, your community. Um, writing to the globe, at some point on this, we may wanna have some media in the globe around the importance of, um, of these bills admit one more person. And then, you know, I, I think one of the key things I bold is, is relationships. Um, if you don't have a relationship currently with your legislator, with their staff members, um, start now, start building that relationship. Um, tell them your story, introduce yourself, uh, find out what's on their plate, what's important to them, support some of their issues where you align. And, um, and then, like I said, year round, keep following up, really get um, get in front of them as much as possible. And that can be virtual, that can be office hours in their district, that can be emails, um, checking in by phone here and there, especially if you've sent out a communication like a letter, follow up with a phone call, just let them know, sent it, wanted to make sure you got it. Um, and so what, you know, what is the goal when we're contacting our legislators? Um, we talked a lot about the hearing. So we want, we really want these bills to get out of their committees and be ready to be passed, right? That's the ultimate goal. Well, the really important thing that your rep and senator can do is they can prioritize our bills. So, you know, when they go and meet with their leadership, um, the chairs of Ways and Means, the Speaker of the House, the Senate President, you want our issues to be their issues. You want our priorities to be their priorities. So it makes like a funnel. So we all talk, I talk to my rep, you talk to your rep, talk to your Senator, they bring it to their leadership. And that's when we start to see things move. Um, and getting it through committee is critical. But the next step is also critical. And that's where it's really important that your rep and senator are willing to go to leadership on this. Um, and please, anybody jump in and add here because, I, you know, I, 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 I ex totally would love everyone else's feedback. Um, and just a little tips, tips from me and actually from my personal uh, advocacy. I tend to talk a lot about my children. <laughs> so I need this reminder more than anyone. Uh, there's my son, Neil, who just turned 22 on Saturday. So here I am in the, right into the adult world of, of services and supports. Um, but I, I do need to be reminded, you know, Every time I tell Neil's story, I don't have to tell his whole history. I don't have to tell when he was diagnosed, what the problems were when he was younger. Um, I need to really focus on exactly um, what my ask is and you know the relevant problems um, that really affect him and our family. And so, you know, Neil isn't using transportation at this point, um, but I expect that he certainly will. And um, so what I like to do is when I think about it, I try to put down an outline. Um, I try to think about, you know, a short description of, of Neil, who he is, how old he is. I try to think about what are my, my biggest problems? What is my need? And then I try to put in what is my ask? 
um, and kind of combine those into my testimony, whether it's written testimony, oral testimony, or I'm just trying to outline the issue in a conversation um, with my rep or their staff, right? Um, for this, I, I just have an example because uh, Neil really relies on his direct support professionals. Um, and I think about this a lot when we're trying to increase the rate of pay, right? What what is the issue? We we just don't have enough DSPs. And um, Neil needs someone that's really well-trained, that can follow very tricky medication routines, that um, can understand some of the triggers that can really um, end in unsafe behavior for Neil and try to avoid those triggers. They have to learn how to support him um, when he is having unsafe behavior. They have to learn a whole new communication system. So you get it. Um, you know, I really try to make it understandable, um, you know, from Neil's story. So that's what we want to try to do about our, our transportation experiences. Okay, so this is just a, too much on one slide, but just like a quick overview of, you know, what happens once these bills get filed. And I don't know, this year, I I think there's over 6,000, maybe 7,000 bills filed this year. Um, and, you know, we're right in a place right now where the bills can still um, be co-sponsored. So this is an important time to continue to reach out to your rep and senator um, and ask them to co-sponsor the bill. And then, you know, make sure they understand what that really means to you. Co-sponsoring means that you are um, going to help with this bill right to the end uh, and, and to really learn about the bill and, and learn why it's important. Maybe write a letter to the committee and then again, maybe keep it as a priority as, as the year, as the session goes. Um, so we talked about, you know, how the bill will be assigned to committees and, and these bills have been assigned and we're aware. And so now we're watching, you know, when, when are these hearings going to come? But why not just be prepared in advance and get your testimony ready. Um, we talked about it being, you know, a three minute maximum, but it can be shorter. If you can tell your story in a minute and make it powerful, um, that's great too. And then your written testimony can always be much longer. You can meet with your legislators beforehand. Um, you, you can sign up and, and testify with a panel. Hopefully this coalition will stay together and we'll be able to kind of set up some, some panels of folks for the, for the hearings. Um, and then what happens is hopefully the bill passes favorably. It may go on to a second committee. Um, it may end up in ways and means. And that's the final stretch, right? And honestly, I think that's where some of the really, really hard work comes in. And um, if anyone is up for it, I, I think that's a, a time to make some trips into the state house um, or do a lot of visiting in your district, um, because this is when you'll know, you know, is your rep or senator a champion? Will they take that bill and help you get it past the, the finish line? All right, I'm talking a lot, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end here and stop my share. Hopefully I kept us with plenty of time for questions and stories. Yeah, I think so. All right, so questions on the bills, on the process. Oh, so Ali has, Lee, do you have your hand up? Go, go right ahead, Lee. Yeah, I just have a question. Uh, it's about the uh, the PT1 um, human service thing. Uh, uh, last week I took uh, somebody who uh, had a pain management appointment and uh, they wanted her to have an MRI and so I, I was able to call and book the MRI two hours, same day after the appointment, that, and she had it done. Now, if she had to do all this by medical transportation, it, it would have taken her weeks. And, uh, and because I have a car, I was able to take her around, and we can get this done in like 72 hours. And the other question is, uh, are medical providers dropping patients who uh, just don't show up for appointments because of the unreliability of the PT1 system? Uh, those those are great questions. I'm going to let someone else answer the answer both of those actually because I'm not I'm not the expert. Because I would think that there would be a problem if people are providers are dropping people just because they're not showing up with a PT one, you know, on both ends of revenue and for the doctors or providers, 
and then the person who was seeking the uh, medical help is not getting the service. Absolutely. Where my friend uh, is now going to have to go through hip replacement surgery because we, uh, I got her in so fast and was able to do the MRI and everything two hours after the appointment. That was great. I mean, I do think uh, anecdotally we are hearing that that's happening, but I don't know if someone has more more info to share. Chris, do you have your hand up for that? I mean, what's being done for same day or uh, urgent, next day urgent transportation for PT1s and the approval process to get them? So um, two things. I know I've heard from anecdotally from many providers that um, they have patients who who show up hours late or miss essential appointments. I mean, virtually any doctor you ask, they'll say this is a problem. Um, I think there have been improvements with that over time. Um, the process for getting a PT1 approved, so you have to your, your, piece, your primary care physician put in a prescription. I think that's supposed to be easier with an, a portal to do that, but it still takes a few days. Um, but then um, once you have one, um, they ask for three day advanced notice, but they will, I've had it done. I've had them, they say we can't guarantee it same day, but they they have done that for me. It's, it's happened, but um, it, you do point out, you know, it, and that makes some sense to me that they might have difficulty doing the same day, but um, uh, so, but that's sort of the the, the situation. Um, I hope that's maybe, helpful. Uh, maybe PT one might be uh, go the way of a lift, like the ride does. You can, you know, get it on demand type thing. You know, whether the same day, next day, or whatever, and not wait all these people for that delays treatment and everything. Absolutely. Rep, did you want to jump in there? Yeah, thank you. Um, I was going to say that if anybody on the call, if, the, if these experiences have happened to you or you know someone, particularly if they have found it difficult to reschedule like a medical appointment because they were late and they missed an appointment because of their transportation, that's a good experience to share with the committee. Um, and that's the, a good example of what a consumer advisory board or an extended task force would continue to be able to address. So those are kind of the exact kind of experiences that legislators need to know may happen and then think, oh, and one way to correct that is to make sure that there's this communication loop of consumers back to the administration. So I just wanted to thank you for raising it um, because I have heard about people losing um, their place in a practice, a medical practice, because they've been sometimes systematically late because of transportation issues. Um, and so I think that's important for legislators to know. Thank you. It affects me because I have a car and I'm taking uh, people around because they can't get the PT1. And, uh, you know, that's not my role just because I have a car, you know, because the thank inefficiencies you. of the- Thank uh, you for doing system. that. I think that's amazing, but thank you. And do we have access to that type of data in terms of um, missed appointments based on, you know, being late because of transportation or no shows? Something to something to think about trying to collect in some way. Okay, I know we have other hands. Donna has had her hand up. Yep. Hi. Um, I understand what you guys are trying to accomplish, but what? is available right now to, I mean, if there's funding available, um, we have to deal th through GATRA, who is impossible, impossible. I'm not sure what they do on a daily basis to try to get more companies, you know, signed up to work through MassHealth. My son's 22, just started um, in Norton. We're from Brockton. So I have to drive him 40 minutes each way. Um, and I had originally hoped to, to maybe get a part-time job, but I can't because I have to help him. Yeah. Donna, you're driving to a day program every yeah. day? Yes. And I know that there's reimbursement for the mileage and stuff, but that's not helpful. 
No, not if you have to work and <laughs> yeah. No, that if you can, you know, write up your story, be ready to share your story. I think that would be wonderful connecting with your legislator on this specifically. I've tried. Nobody's I I've tried. It's I can't get anywhere. Right, right. Well, maybe connecting around these bills is a first step too, you know, because I think these bills will address they will force the state to address this, right? Um, so that's at least one way. Okay. Okay. I see a bunch of uh, Myra, chat questions. Um, I've seen your call. I've been reaching out. I just want to hear your voice. I hope you're well. Um, in the meantime, I'm right. That sounds like I need to meet someone. Um, Hold on a sec. On this week, Wednesday, mm -hmm. um, when tech goes home. Can anybody see who's that? About how to yeah, I believe it's Dorothy. I'm going to meet. Okay. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. I think Jacqueline has her hand up or do you Jacqueline? Hi, I do. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. So I, I live in Chelsea and I work at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston and I'm a public health practitioner, but I also work uh, in the clinical setting as well with uh, patients with asthma. And part of my work involves um, helping patients with multiple issues, including transportation. And I also have a personal issue with it because my brother who um, had to have a kidney, a kidney transplant, I was dealing with PT1 for years for him and for years in my work. So this problem has been going on for a very long time. Maybe the bills are start of it. I hope so. I truly do. But someone just before I came on mentioned something about revamping the PT1 approval process. When I tell, I can't count how many times I have had issue with not only my patients missing their appointments because of a ride or personally with my brother that, because I, I live in Chelsea and he lives in Boston and I have to take him to many of his uh, appointments because of PT1. It's horrendous. I don't know how these people get approved to be drivers. I really don't get it. I mean, I actually, I reached out, you know, I've done it because this is my work. So I actually know how to navigate this and I still don't get it. What is it about this approval process that anybody can just open up a shop and be a transportation vendor? It's outrageous. So I am very much looking forward to this bill. I mean, we have to hold on to hope, even though I've been going through this for at least 15 years or more, I still have hope. So, you know, I thank Rep. Dom for the work that she's doing. And I, I will I will write letters. I will contact legislators again. But we all have to keep doing it and figure out this approval process. I think that's an area we should look at. And you asked a question about, are there any uh, records of people missing appointments because of the ride? Yes, all the hospitals, all the health centers, we all have it. We know we report it all the time. So I, I'm just, I'm, I'm hoping that this will help. And thank you so much for pulling this meeting together. Someone sent it to me and I was very pleased to be able to just hear other people's stories and other people's testimony and to know that um, you know, Dom Rep is here and you guys care about this issue and you're looking into it. So please, we're counting on you and you're counting on us. Let's do this together. Thank you. That was great, Jacqueline. Thank you so much. Bill, Bill, please jump in. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Bill Henning uh, with Boston Center for Independent Living. And I'm uh, happy to be home after spending six hours in Gardner Auditorium today at the House Ways and Means hearing. And I saw Mara there. It was taxing to say the least. <laughs> but anyway, these are just dramatic stories, which of course we hope everyone uh, can convey that at the hearing on the bill. I'm gonna put my contact information in the chat and I see Chris Ho did the same. Um, we would like to work with you right now at BCIL or work with a provider or advocates in your area on some of these extremely distressing issues. It seems like 
Um, it also seems there might be a little bit of confusion between PT1 Medicaid service and HST human services, say through um, DDS or DMH or mass rehab, for instance, and maybe we can work some of those levers. No promises, but um, I'll put my contact info in K. Um, Shukar, who's on the uh, in the meeting too, we can uh, try to work with that, and I'll, I'll work. I work closely with Chris Ho too, uh, you know, about five times a week, I think it is these days. So thank you for everybody. And Jacqueline, I'd love to hear if we could get some of those medical providers to speak up because we know on that end the issues are huge, and we've had a real difficulty getting people to come forward. I don't know why because we know they feel the brunt of it in a different kind of way than the consumer, but they don't wanna see uh, people hurt. So thank you. Thanks for organizing this. Thanks, Representative Dom, just super, bye-bye. Thanks, Bill. Chris, is your hand up still or no? Okay. Um, if there's time, um, yeah. and I don't recognize Bill without a pile of his desk <laughs> behind him with all the papers on it. I just put my email in because um, there are improvements that should be taking effect already. Um, and that one of the things is just that anyone, if you have a bad experience with a transportation provider, you can complain and tell them to be excluded so that they <coughs> never provide transportation for you again. And if you get any pushback, you tell them that's the law, that's the rules. Also, if there are pro providers who do a good job, you can have them as prefer preferential up to three so that when you ask for uh, a ride, they get asked first, okay? So that's something that unfortunately you have to have a bad experience to get rid of someone. Um, but, um, and then any other, uh, any questions just about how to navigate system as it is now, please feel it free to reach out to me um, and uh, Bill's also put that in there. Those of us who've been fighting this for a long time have learned some of the tricks and we don't want anyone else to have to go through what well all of us have gone through. So thank you. Um, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, you guys are really the experts. So thank you for putting your, your contacts in there. I think Lee might have had her hand up again. I saw. Oh, you got to unmute, unmute Lee. There you go. Yeah. Um, my concern is uh, there's two types of programs that's being uh, excluded from uh, PT1s, and they're very valuable for people with mental illness, and they can't use those PT1s for that. And one of them is, is uh, a program called Gateway Arts in Brookline, and that's um, under BIMFIN, and that serves people with psych disability and uh, Developmental disabilities, and the other one is at the clubhouses across the state. Uh, they can't, they can't use PT ones for that either, and th and those two programs alone will save thousands of dollars in psychiatric hospitalizations if people would just be able to get to them with a PT one, and just like a day program, a day treatment program, but they're not treated that way because they don't have nurses or doctors on site, and uh, that that needs to change because. Uh, if somebody can go to a clubhouse or a gateway arts program under Vinfin and still get PT1, like I said, you're going to save thousands of dollars in Medicaid funds. And I'm just seeing that because I've had to transport people to gateway because they couldn't uh, get to use a PT1 and they can't physically do the uh, public transportation. And the ride, the ride from the MBTA is too unreliable. Thank you, Lee. Any other, oh, Jessica, do you have another question? Well, more of a comment. I was gonna try to sit here quietly and not say anything, but I guess that's never an option for me. Oh. Um, so, uh, no, I just was gonna say, when we started really gathering stories around this many moons ago, um, it was a really uh, meet people where they were at effort. Um, doctor's offices, hospitals, like heard we were talking about it and invited, us in um, and to talk to people. And they kind of set us in a, up in a room and said, if you would like to talk to them, they're here. And that 
isn't happening anymore because of the pandemic. And I think that might be affecting why it's so hard to get stories um, because, you know, they don't want extra people sitting in their offices anymore. That's not, mm -hmm. that's not a thing. So uh, as we're trying to reach people, I guess the one thing I would suggest is see what we can do to kind of overcome that barrier. Cause it, when we, you know, got people to the listening sessions, I orchestrated all the Ubers. <laughs> I had like four cell phones going so um, to get people at like that one listening session. So it really, we had to go to them for, for most of the advocacy. And that's just something to think about. Hopefully Zoom meetings have helped, but, you know, uh, something to think about on how to reach folks, see what we can do to get doctors to kind of help invite us back in maybe. Absolutely. Rep, do you want to say? Yeah, I just want to underscore that what people may be thinking are just their complaints or sharing their past experience. I'm underscoring that this is the basis of these bills um, because it's government's job to be able to hear those complaints and those concerns and then make it better. And so both Senator Moran and I felt through our experience on the task force that the task force provided one megaphone for consumer voices, but that this and that this consumer advisory board would provide another sort of institutionalized consumer voice. So this is exactly what I think needs to happen is to be able to explain for experience and then say, if there's no extended task force or if there's no consumer advisory board, how would government hear this? How would we know what to fix? Um, granted, there's, you know, you have a great advocate like Chris, who like is right in there and always trying to make it better, but all of us aren't Chris's, you know, we're, 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 and so we need to know that government is creating the structure to make sure that they do hear these stories and these experiences, because without them, they'll think everything's hunky-dory if they don't hear different. So I just, I'm really appreciating, um, people's experiences. I know in the task force, you know, through a lot of the people who are on it, their leadership, there were fixes put into place. I want to know how those fixes are working. And so that's another reason why I want the extended task force. Were they good? Do they need to be changed in some way? Did real life experience make those fixes not appropriate? And we learned something else. Um, so thank you everybody really for sharing these experiences. I think this is very valuable. Thank you, Rep. And I would just add um, that I think the improvements are so important, but that we always have to be aware that we're in a workforce shortage crisis that could continue. Um, so we have to remember that um, our voices need to be as loud as every other area that's in a workforce shortage crisis. Um, and I'm very excited because we have all of your emails because you registered. <laughs> and um, we also have all the people who registered and said, it's 65 degrees out. I'm not going to stay inside tonight. <laughs> so we'll we'll be able to contact all of them, get everybody ready um, for when it's time to, to testify um, and really understand what we need to do in front of the legislative committees. No. Unless anybody has any other questions, we can wrap up right on time. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Rep Dome, for your wonderful, incredible leadership. And uh, pass it on to Senator Moran, too. And I love how you guys work together. It's fantastic. Right. Thank Thanks. you for organizing and for pulling us all together to everyone who organized this so much. Thank you. Yeah. All right, everyone. Stay well. You have all our emails and um, happy spring. <laughs> Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.